the birds have a pretty happy life there. <laughs> they love it, yeah. They, they do. do. Well, there's a heap of them too. Yeah, there's a lot of birds around. Um, okay, we're on, boys. Hang on, let me just check this. Yeah, I can hear, I can hear that, all right. Um, welcome to The Regenerative Journey, John and Kim, and welcome to the western veranda of the main, <laughs> main homestead here mm -hmm. at Koleski Farm. Um, I might start with you, Kim. Uh, well, we're just talking about the birds and how wonderful they were that these microphones could pick them up so well. We're luckily we haven't got the little bunch of little ones in the tree here because they, <laughs> they were quite noisy. <laughs> Is that a fox over there? Yeah, we saw a fox. You have foxes here? We do. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. He just uh, went into that. See that big pile of timber oh, there? Yep. Just to the, on the bottom side in the shadow, he just went into that thing. Okay, I didn't see him. I can't see it. It's right. quite possible the neighbours' uh, sheep are lambing at the moment, yeah. so well, ours are lambing at the moment. Out. That's right, well, there's one down here, I think. Just on the fence, like, like a sheep just down there, isn't it? On the other side of the fence. Oh. Or is that a post? Oh, no, could no, be that's a stump. A, that's a post. Yep. Bad my, bad's my side. Kim, I'll start with you. Um, oh, well, uh, for the listeners, we've got John and Kim Koleski. Um, we are at Koleski Farm, and we've been here for a couple of days. Doing uh, we've done one day of our biodynamic um, interaction biodynamics workshop, which has been wonderful. And this this is a biodynamic farm. We'll get into sort of how and who and why, you know, soon. Um, but oh, I've got to remember to swing this microphone. Or oh, Kim, you might remember to do that yeah, too. Yeah, all right. <coughs> I've only got I've got three three men and two mi two microphones. Um, <laughs> Kim, what's it, what is it like to be here, um, sitting next to your dad, looking out at, I know that over the road is not yours, but this part yep. here is, you grew up in this house, what does it feel like to be sitting here with dad, I was, it was wonderful hearing you two chatter away there, I was just getting organised in the room behind me, okay. you two chatter yeah. away, I was easy. Um, <laughs> oh look, I'm, I'm extremely proud and I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, um, to have this opportunity and have this in front of me. Um, for what mum and dad did years ago, they worked so hard to, to set this up so I could actually come into a, a farm that was productive, um, it was profitable and it was a great place to live and work and, uh, and then um, you know when we did go completely organic biodynamic, uh, obviously a, a healthy environment to work into so, and, and working beside mum and dad for so long. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure, um, and uh, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, yeah. And John, what's it like sitting here with your son, who's doing wonderful things with the farm that you, you know, you, you grew up here. We'll get to sort of the generational, wonderful generational thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. What, what, what's it like sitting next? You're proud of this bloke here? Yes, we are. <laughs> Mum and I are very proud. <laughs> proud of Kim. Yeah, the, the job he's doing, and and and. That is, that is carrying on and, and doing what we believed in, you know, of, of doing things naturally as possible, organically, biodynamically. Um, we're, we're proud of our whole family that they're all inclined the same way. So it's, it's a joy for us, a great joy for us that it's continuing like that, yes. And you, you, you're, we'll get to a bit later on, but you're, I might as well say it up front, you're, <coughs> you're sixth generation Koleski here. Yes. Yeah. Troy being sitting up, you know, seven in yeah, the, in, in the family. Yeah, children are seventh, yes. And um, and obviously your grandchildren, those that are, that are on on farm, they're they eighth generation. That's yeah. quite remarkable. Yes, yes, it is. It's, it's there's there's a lot of history here on this farm, you know, and and still being in 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 the family. Yeah, we're, we're proud of it, and and it looks promising with the with the grandchildren that there'll be that everything will keep going so at this stage so and that's a great joy for Lorraine and I as parents as grandparents as mm. well so <coughs> yeah so. let's because you're the older of the two John not by much but um what if you, well, I'll stick with you tell me um so you you grew up here you were you started your your life um in what was your your father was he in, you know, what was his sort of philosophy on farming? Um, he he didn't have any in, in you know. Well, I suppose when when he would have been young, they would have been pretty well organically farming right back in his early years. Mm. But um, obviously, then superphosphate came in and everything else. Things changed, um, and he was just happy to carry on the way what he had learnt from his father, I suppose, in a way, and and. Uh, 
he didn't have any inclination of of changing things and, and going down the organic path or anything like that, you know. So um, I suppose it was in the in about in the middle eighties when we sort of just didn't feel right the way things were going. We're using chemicals and things like that, and and, um, and that we started playing around with uh, you know using some biology and things like that. And at the same time, at that early stage. Um, there was limited information out there to, you know, it was pretty hard, um, pretty hard to get information and what to do. And we were pretty green ourselves and limited knowledge, but we, we went to as many biological organic conferences type of thing, what we could get our hands on. Uh, we, in South Australia or even interstate and gradually built more knowledge. We had more knowledge of things and understood things better. Um, I think our turning point came when we we went wherever it was to one organic conference and the emphasis there was very much on having your soils balanced and we um, came home, we, did, we soil tested the whole property and then we knew where, you know, our shortfalls of things and um, we try to adjust our property as much as possible to have it your calcium magnesium ratios and everything else as much in balance as possible um, and, and I, I've since that I think that that was a real turning point for us and then well then we became fully certified organic and then after that biodynamic so uh, we feel biodynamics is the pinnac pinnacle of organic so yes. Yeah, so that's that's what we do so. <coughs> we'll get back to we'll get back to the biodynamics because that's obviously a, one of your sort of <coughs> Killers of, of soil health and, and human health and environmental health. Yes. What explain sort of tell us a bit more about your childhood here? You know that so so just so I'm clear, your the farming practices of your dad and and you as a youngster were more more conventional, I guess. Yeah. Yes. What was it? What was it like living being a young buck here in um in the Barossa Valley? You know, you, you were you were sixth generation then. Did that mean anything to you? To then was it sort of did you feel the legacy or were you you know kind of thinking about the previous generations was that of importance to you or are you just like you're a farmer boy just getting on with the job yeah it, it was probably more of a farmer boy getting on with the job because i think when you're young you, you don't think much about generations and everything like that um i'm certainly you know proud to be here and and, and have the opportunity but um yeah it's, it's not not the same as what you think about things today as you're getting older, you know, and, and appreciate things more, you know. Uh, um, yeah, I just can't remember what was one of the first questions you asked me. Oh, oh no, just the, um, you know, like what, what was, you know, your life here, you were, you had mixed, uh, mixed enterprise, you have, you had, you, you, grapes didn't go in until a bit like, like later on, wasn't it? No, no, grapes. no. no. Oh, no, grapes were here in, in hang on, 1875. That's right. Grapes <laughs> have been here for a long, long time. <laughs> They've grapes been here for a long time. Yeah, yeah, grapes have been here for a long time. Well, we were, we were basically grape growing. It was very much a mixed farm. Grape growing, dairy, uh, pigs, uh, chooks. Mm. Orchard. Orchard, April, yeah, fruit yeah. orchard. Or, yeah. So a commercial orchard to a area a com where you commercial, were commercial wow. orchard, yeah. It, it was typical of the mixed farms in the Brossa in those days, yes. uh, you know. But then in time, as, as all things, you, you could see that you have to go into enterprises and, and have less enterprises, but bigger, bigger enterprises mm -hmm. to uh, be, be really viable. Um, Do you think yeah. that's been a, that's been a bit of a trend over time that, that, that you know, whether farmers that have to make that decision or forced into it, or it's just a sensible decision to, you know, not be so quite diverse and spread yourself so thin over too many enterprises? You, you think that's a was that kind of a decision you consciously made or that's just the way it ended up going? Well, probably more the way it ended up going, I suppose, in, in, a, in a way, yeah, because, um, because I mean, it, originally, like, it was reasonably small quantities of everything. I suppose Vineyard was, was still the main enterprise, even way back when I left school and uh, started working home. The vineyard was still the main enterprise then, but, uh, but you know, a few cows and pigs and stuff like that, but... but uh, yeah, eventually we just felt we had a specialised mainly, mainly in, in vineyard and 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 uh, all the organic cropping now as, as well, of course. Um, then you you built the dairy a, a new dairy. 
Yes, that's and right. So yeah, when when Ray and I got married, we we were still milking cows by hand, which was pretty disgraceful. <laughs> wow, how many cows? Like you, uh, you were milking by hand as, in a commercial sense. Yeah, in a commercial sense, and selling cream, Straight. which was a pretty pitiful price. Yeah. We thought, well, and Lorraine, having grown up on a, on a dairy farm where they had more cows, so we, we built built a new dairy and and uh, milk with a machine, and uh, that was a day and night change for us because even even the first we still remember the very first milk check we got was about four times the amount of what when we sold cream the very first month we it was just such a such a game changer mm. and, and so uh, focusing on milk not not the cream side of it yeah that's right selling whole milk yes. yeah and um and you you built the entire dairy yeah yourself. Ray and i built the entire dairy from scratch yeah brick by brick and the whole thing i still remember um we we started building dairy after we finished the summer harvest and it was late January, early February we started on it and then it was vintage came along we were hand picking all the grapes at that stage and um, and we got up, got the walls up on the dairy and some of the timber on the roof and then after picking grapes all day I'd often put on two or three sheets of iron after after knocked off from grape picking and and uh, just to try and get this dairy finished that we could use it and uh, it was just on the start of pruning season then, we had the dairy all finished because concrete floor had to go in, the yards, have, uh, you know, I made up all the bales in the yard, everything. We, we had had no money, we had to, had to make everything ourselves and um, and when we we milked in the dairy for the first time, it was, was pretty exciting, yeah, so quite, that, a, quite a change. Yeah. And you and how long did you milk in the dairy, like how long, how long were you doing that, that uh, we that We had cows in for, it was 15 years uh, and then we decided well um, by that time we had also in the middle of 70s we had started a we were selling hay uh, as well and then we um, things were pretty tight with the grape industry where grapes were hard difficult to sell we had a young family and two families living off the property and we decided we'd have to we'd value add the hay instead of selling the hay we'd value add the hay so we, we bought ourselves a, a portable, big portable chaff, commercial chaff cutter. And it was rather um, me meant to be, I think, because um, we bought this chaff cutter and there was an advert in the stock journal, someone looking wanting to buy chaff. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was meant to be. Yeah, it was meant to be. Meant to be. <laughs> and and um, we had an opportunity, we contacted them and, and um, yeah, we, they were our first customer, and it just it just grew from there. And um, but this was a big portable machine. Um, it was quite okay to get going, but my dream was still to have a, a permanent setup chaff milling operation. And um, we bought an old chaff cutter from over at Freeling. Um, a, that mill had been shut for many many years, and I completely rebuilt the machine. Uh, it was an old wooden frame one, uh, rebuilt it all with steel and and um, built the whole chaff mill set up. I think it took me about three years to, to build it all. Just in, I didn't have a lot of spare time um, doing the farm work as well, but then we, could, then we had a proper commercial mill set up and we did that for um, yeah, 42 years. We cut chaff. Wow. And, uh, you only stopped doing it a couple of years ago. Only, only a couple mm. of years ago, yes, yeah, yes. Right. Kim just felt well. We were spreading ourselves a bit thin, and because we, and it, that was true. We we had to put more emphasis on the grape growing yeah. side of it. Because we had, um, we had planted um, a whole lot more vineyards. So probably from the late nineties yeah. up until um, I don't know for 15, 15 years there, we probably planted you know close to seventy acres of vineyard. Um, so that's that's a massive undertaking so that's that's a lot of time and effort and and cost and uh, so yeah we were spreading ourselves a bit thin and then with the chaff mill we were getting um a local farmer to grow the hay or as a standing crop we'd go and cut it and bale it and cart it and everything like that but he was a chemical farmer uh so we were bringing that hay onto a organic property we we're cutting this hay and uh, you know there's whenever you cut hay there's there's dust um, 
and we were just thinking like why are we doing this when you know we mm. can, we've got enough vineyard to keep us occupied and uh, and plenty of work so that's why we decided to uh, give it away and also it was hard to employ people in the chaff mill for only sort of one day a week is what we were doing mm. and um, yeah so it, it it made a lot of sense to to give it away and I guess I, I think of chaff cutters and chaff mills and I just think danger you know like I, you know this sort of <laughs> hands getting caught and you know sleeves getting caught and those sort of things is that, was that, well, is not. That, some, was that something that not that it might have happened but is that was that also like a bit of an oh and s or w or whatever they call it uh, like, no we like, we, 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 <laughs> we don't end up putting something in the bag we no. we had it set up uh, safely um yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it was safe. So, um, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm not saying it wouldn't have been safe, but it's just that image I always have. You just hear we, old stories of, you know, you read obituaries and they go, oh, you know, he went through a chaff cutter. Oh, like, God. <laughs> no. <laughs> there, there was a time when, um, so we were using round bales, and um, I'm not sure who was feeding the chaff cutter, but uh, occasionally you get sticks or a bit of bark mm. uh, that's been around the outside of the paddock. And. Um, this this one time there was the, the piece of bark uh, the stick actually moved and it was a brown snake oh really yeah. um, mum was feeding at the time yep. yeah um and then we could not find that brown snake so we didn't know where it ended up um, it didn't end up going through the chaff cutter so yeah we were sort of a bit fearful there for a while <laughs> until you know you, you sort of forget about it then Classic. Yeah. Um, Kim, what about your your childhood? You, you, were, you were seventh generation. Well, you, you are, of course, um, still. Uh, what you know? What was life like for you growing up on the farm? With, Look, with think, two big. What are these? What are they? They're, they're like. <laughs> I don't know. They're massive. And they look really scary, but they're little, they're little sorts. Oh, pictures. Rottweiler and a bull mastiff. Um, <laughs> yeah, so they we. Are, they are the cutest. The softest little right. dogs, are they? Right. Like yeah, oh, they are. They're, they're right. soft as. Uh, but if you uh, came here to rob the house, then I don't think I'd be getting out of the car. No, you wouldn't be. Um, oh, look, oh, we, we, we always grew up with dogs. A um, lot, of, lot of German Shepherds, uh, Rottweilers. Um, always big dogs um, on, the, on the property. Um, as a kid, look, we, we had a massive playground. Always riding our bikes around motorbikes. Um, so we had a lot of freedoms there. Uh, so never, never bored. I do remember that um, we, there was a bit of stone picking to do on the farm. <laughs> did that scar you? Did it? There's an emotional scar. And <laughs> dad, dad, dad would always there, say, "Oh, there's a few stones to pick up. <laughs> always only a few stones." <laughs> and you know, a few hours later, you're still picking up stones. And uh, as a kid, you know, hours seem like forever. Um, as an adult, when you you start working, well, you know it's no big deal. But when you're a kid, you think, well, this is ridiculous. This is <laughs> like it's never going to end. <laughs> um, I, I do remember that. But um, and then we were when we were cutting hay on the on the property with binders, um, sheaved hay. Uh, the, there was what's called stooking, so putting all the sheaves together into um, sort of smaller. Uh, Bundle bundles, yeah, yeah um, to be able to pick up with a with a machine to load. So I did a lot of stooking, and I got paid per stook. So you know, as a kid after school, you know, you'd go pretty hard for for an hour or two, and try and earn as much money as possible. And that was the same with grape picking. Um, you get home from school, you have something to eat, you get grape picking, and you get paid per bucket. Mm. And uh, you know, you you work hard for that hour and a half or so to try and earn a bit of pocket money. And uh, yeah, I mean, I used to really enjoy it because I always wanted to be a farmer, grape grower. Um, so I enjoyed the work. My sister, uh, anything to do with vineyard, she hated it. Yeah. Absolutely hated oh, really? it. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't stand it. So especially the, the winter work. So dad would prune at, oh, with my grandpa and us kids would go and do what's called pulling off. So take all the rest of the sticks and, and put it in the mid row. And uh, yeah, my sister used to absolutely hate doing that. And of course, winter time, you get clipped around the ears occasionally with a rod. <coughs> and uh, you're well, cold. Well, you clip around the ears because you're not doing Not because you're naughty, no. That was just uh, <laughs> just the way it happens. Oh, really? Yeah, so you just, you just, you just pull the wood off and oh, sometimes it, it, it grips yeah. and then suddenly yeah. releases and it uh, oh, hits right. you. Um, so that was... So she um, wasn't a big fan of that. She wasn't a big fan of that. 
but I, I didn't mind doing it, especially after my grandpa had uh, done the pruning, he would cut the wood up a whole lot more, and so it was so easy to pull off. Yeah, as right. opposed to dad, he would do less cuts, and it would be a lot harder. Harder for you. So you yeah. you, you you suffered because of dad. Didn't <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> but I mean I pruned exactly the same, fewer yeah. cuts, yeah. and because uh, it's pulling off is unskilled work. Yeah, that's um, right. You don't have to make any decisions, no. as opposed to pruning where you know you, you're making decisions, lots of decisions on critical. every vine has to be skilled work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yesterday you showed me the old cart that that used to used to be oh. drawn along between the vines. Yeah, and those <coughs> canes would be thrown in, and they would be it would be a burning it'd be burning along. Yeah, and you'd throw it in there, and then it just that that's the right. Drop through, so that was a form of replacing you know some carbon which is interesting but yeah. you don't do that anymore well do no um everything gets slashed off or, or rotated in so it gets chopped up into mm. into little bits um well dad I, I can i never saw you going through picking up the sticks and burning them did you do that john yeah that was that well, was it was fascinating. I guess that I mean I don't know if there's any photos of that, but I reckon that would have been fascinating. This, yeah, no. What, what was what was just a bit further away there? Yeah, that's it. Oh. Perfect, perfect. Wait, what, wait. What, so what was dragging that car? Was it a a horse? Yeah, a horse was a horse in front, was dragging a car. Horse was, was a burning, a burning, burning pile of burning. <laughs> well, vine behind it. Yeah, when I when I left school, um, we were still burning sticks, and we had a, a row either side of the cart, and. and my dad was throwing in one side and I was throwing in the other side into this cart. We just kept, all the sticks were put in little heaps down the road and and, um, and then the horse would just keep moving along slowly and I, I tell you a story when our, our we only had, because horses were going out by this time and we only had two horses left and our favourite burner horse was a Beautiful old quiet horse. Burner horse, that was the name. <laughs> that was the thing. It's called a burner horse. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> see, like old, old, old age <laughs> and this old horse died. So dad had to use the other horse, which was a bit more toey for burning burning vine sticks. And we were burning vine sticks one day with this other horse and the fire suddenly started to crackle. Oh. And he got scared and he took off in the vineyard with this vine burner behind and went slanty across the vineyard and heading straight towards the haystack. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so, so what, we, I don't know what, what happened. We next. managed to guide him off far enough away, yeah, and he settled down and, and everything was okay, but it was a bit scary at the moment. So. <laughs> That's fascinating. I never, even th I never even thought that that was a thing or even a burner horse. That bit later. Yeah. So that was, did you move away from that just because there were alternatives or you changed your philosophy on on the burning or just you thought oh this is all too crazy and dangerous or what was what was the change of thought there well by that time um people were starting to throw their sticks down the middle of the vine rows and and discs came in to chop up the sticks yeah. and uh, yeah that that made things somewhat easier and better and safer <laughs> <laughs> and safer but it just saved a lot of work not having to put the, all the sticks into little heaps mm. you didn't have to be as fussy as long as they were in the in the row it was okay um, yeah, that that was that was a lot better. So. John, um, what about the the philosophy? You know that you you um, you instilled in the business in on the farm. You know what was the because you could have just done you could have just rolled along commercially and more products of you know more super sort of or different you know types of chemical that made things easier or you know the pressure from general. Just, the, just the, the community general pressure, not necessarily specifically on you, but just like, oh, this is how you do it here. You know, you use your super and your sewing, you put mm. your MAP, your DAP, and but what was, what can you remember, was there a defining moment or was there, was it a sort of a slow burn that you just thought, I just don't, I don't want to do this anymore? Yeah, Pro probably more slow than anything. I, I, I think my, I didn't have quite as much problem with putting out artificial fertilizers even though we knew that wasn't ideal either but the real thing came about um, going out weed spraying and having to put chemicals into that spray tank and, and go, I, every it probably was psychological but every time I, I got ended up with a severe headache every time I sort of did that sort of thing and I started to think this is crazy this not isn't the way we should be farming 
Um, that's why I started to think down different lines and, and uh, we've gradually started thinking more along that biological path. So, but, yeah. And the conference you went to was obviously a catalyst for, for that? Yes, we, we're, I don't even remember where we went that time, but yeah, that, that, was, that was the catalyst for, for a change of thought. Um, originally, we just, we just started with one paddock. We, didn't, we thought we'll try one paddock first of all, go down that biological path. We did that for a number of years. Um, weren't really seeing great results, uh, uh, I suppose through lack of understanding as well. But also, when you work with nature, things change slowly. It's not, it's not an instant thing, like throwing out a heap of urea and you get an instant result. It's, it's, with nature, it's entirely different. Um, but anyway, we hung in there and then eventually we, we went down the organic path completely and all the vineyard side of it, first of all. And um, that was working well. Um, and then we then went down the organic path on the farming side as well, which was, it was a, a fairly big decision to make, but uh, that's what we did. And uh, I think the thing was, we went down the organic path on the vineyard side and we were, some of the neighbours sort of knew we were, had gone down that path, even though we didn't say very much to anybody. Um, but w our, once we went down that organic path, we, our grapes seemed to have improved in quality. We were, were starting to get higher results with our grapes at the, at the wineries. We only sold to one winery at that stage, um, at Penfolds, and we started getting more grapes going into their top end, into, into Grange, and um, we had we used to get some quite snide remarks from, from neighbours at times, but once they started to see the results we were getting with the grapes, then they started asking questions, now what are you really doing? Mm -hmm. And, and um, yeah, the snide <coughs> remarks stopped and, and everything changed. So, But we were firm in what we believed, what we were doing, and uh, we, we became, you know, you get a bit thick-skinned after a while and you don't really care what <coughs> anyone thinks what you're doing, you do what you believe is right and for the good of your, of your work, for good of what you're producing and, and for your own health as well. We live by the philosophy that you should be able to eat what you're producing and, and a lot of the food that's produced today. Um, I've got, I just remember an experience, I bought a scare gun from a, um, a vegetable grower down at Virginia, this, this would be 30 years ago probably now. And we bought the scare gun and he said, oh, I'll give you some vegetables. He said, I won't take them from out there, but he come home by the house, I'll he cut us a couple of lettuces or whatever it was. He said, I wouldn't eat what I produce out there. And, and that was a, a, a quite a um, daunting thing for me to think that he was producing this, but he, they would not eat this produce themselves. And um, yeah, so. Yeah, so there was a, so was there a, a um, uh, I guess that means it's 8 o'clock now, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah look at that timing, yeah, they be. almost hit each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a race. It was a race. A race. To get in. Um, what was the, so the cat, you know, like the, the conference was about soil health and farming and that sort of thing. At what point, was there, did you kind of bring in, and you just mentioned a little anecdote there about the spraying, not, you know, that's, oh, sit down. Um, that, you, when did you sort of start thinking about the human health side of that? You know, like, because oh, I want to grow good soil and grow yeah. grapes and everything, but when did you go, oh, but that's actually kind of, there's more to it than just that? Well, I, I think the human health side, really came home to us when uh, one of the speakers from America, Arden Anderson, was over here and he was talking about the soil and human health and, and how he emphasised there that your food should be your medicine. And that was a real uh, turning point for us, I think, when we really connected the soil with human health. Um, yeah, that, that, that was definitely our turning point on that side of it. Um, Kim, what, I mean we've had a few brief chats here in the last couple of days and certainly when we were here 12 months ago, what, what 
mean, and you grew up in that environment, you know, you and you grew up in an environment of, um, of, of, you know, mum and dad were <coughs> conscious of, of that, obviously. Mm. Was that something that you even thought about? I mean, that was obviously normal, but did you go, well, well I'm glad mum and dad are... Well, when, when I first started working home, we were still uh, growing crops with chemicals. Um, and I, so I, that was in the when? So that, that was 89 that I left school. Um, so then going to early 90s, we were still... Uh, I think, um, I'm not quite sure when we stopped uh, growing the crops on our own farm for, for cutting into hay. Um, but I, I remember spraying crops, uh, mixing up the, the spray, and uh, I, I used to hate doing it. The, just the smell of the chemicals uh, were absolutely terrible. And, and we were growing hay to cut into chaff for horses. And I didn't like doing it. And, um, but we couldn't have produce hay with weeds in and cut into chaff. Um, your that, your that was an option. That product was a clean, straight. Had, had to be clean. Know. They were very fussy with weeds. Um, yeah. And then, uh, I'm not sure when it was, but then we actually started um, uh, growing that hay on a, on a farm, sort of probably about four k's away. Oh, we leased land, yeah. Leased, leased land, yeah. so we weren't actually putting chemicals on our own property. Um, and uh, we did that for a while, and then we said, like, we, we don't want to do use chemicals at all. Um, and that's when we got another local farmer to grow the crops for us, and, and we still cut them. Um, so that therefore, we, we got rid of actually us using any chemicals completely. Um, and I know in the early days when I did leave school that we were still looking at biologicals and uh, using different products, uh, sort of monitoring what sort of results we were getting. And there, there were a lot of, there were, there were quite a few products on the market, uh, you know, with a lot of expectation, um, but they, they didn't deliver. They, we didn't get the results. Um, the main problem with going organic is uh, trying to get enough nitrogen into your system for your plants to grow. And uh, because you're, you're not applying urea and, and you're not you applying know. high end, yeah. end yeah. products and, and everything was very low, low nitrogen. And um, so that took us a long time. And that's why we started doing, um, we always did cover crops in the vineyard. Um, we started doing green manure crops out in the land uh, to try and grow more organic matter. Uh, we put in uh, vetch and, uh, and things like that. So legumes to try and build up some nitrogen in the soil naturally. Um, and you know, that, that worked pretty well. Um, and we just sort of kept on progressing from there. And uh, yeah, I guess we, we saw we saw the results mainly come in the vineyard. That was that was the mm, quickest result. Is that because it was more intensive? I mean, you were focusing more on it. I, I think so. Yeah, because that was our main our main product that we we're growing. Mm. Um, so I guess we put more effort, more energy into that, and um, yeah, we we start we started seeing the soil improve a heck of a lot. Uh, it's it's moisture retention. It wasn't as hard as it used to be. Uh, yeah, there was heaps of earthworms. There was there was life in the soil. So and it's continued to get better uh, as we've progressed along uh, further down the bod uh, biodynamic path, as well as um, you know biologicals. Well, when did you get into? Or when and how did you get into biodynamics? Is that was that did John John go down that track, or you turned up one day and said, "Hey, Dad, there's this crazy weirdo stuff that we should do." Uh, that <coughs> well, my uncle Leon, he. Uh, he was doing biodynamics. Um, so, you know, heard a little bit from him uh, about it. Um, I can't actually remember when we started actually applying biodynamics, but um, no, so basically because of what he was doing that we got interested and, and then started applying that ourselves. So you, got, you were certified in 98. So it was obviously some some years before in the 90s oh, yeah, somewhere it was, it was, that happened. It was in, in the 90s. 
Do you think Leon was like sneaking over here with like buckets of prep and like putting it out and not telling you? Well, possibly. I think we should start this bite at home. He goes, well, you already have. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't yeah. know. No, nah, wouldn't know. <laughs> no. And then obviously, you know, Gavin, Gavin Dunn, uh, you know, he'd been doing biodynamics and I suppose Leon learnt from, from him. Yeah. Um, and I don't know when you got to know Gavin, Dad? Uh, I, I, I had gone with Leon a, a number of times um, to Gavin's place as well. And Gavin's know, not far, far away? Where yeah, was not he? very far away, yeah. only about about half an hour away, yeah. Tali. Yeah. And, and uh, we'd been on his property a number of times and because like, Leon was we're already using biodynamics and just in talking to Gavin as well and I gradually became more enthused to, to go down that way. So mm. yeah, it just seemed a natural progression then, you know. So. Did you did you just look at his paddocks or the, or the pro what was the kind of the thing that, that the turning point there was it, you know, was it a, was it, was, were you trying to get away from, or being, you know, getting away from uh, conventional farming and, and chemical use and so on, um, was that the main driver away from that or were you actually drawn towards this new way because you saw what Gavin was doing and Leon and, or was it a bit of both? You know, was it kind of? Probably a bit of both, <coughs> really. Um, I think we, we, we had gone a fair way down the path of, of being organic at that stage. And we just thought, well, if biodynamics would probably put that little cap, the icing on the cake as far as organics go. We just thought, well, that's just another tool uh, to add to your organics, and, and uh, that's what we felt. Yeah, it, mm. it's it's not going to do any harm. It can only only be better. That's that's what we went down the biodynamic side of things. Yeah. For those wine buffs who are listening, um, so when you mentioned Penfolds before, that you were some of your grapes are going into Grange, I believe. Yes, we we had um, about I think it was six six separate blocks that were classed as Grange quality. And and they they didn't go into Grange every year. They 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 would wouldn't quite make it for whatever reason. But um, we had one block that made Grange much more consistent than the other blocks did. And when we um, finally did, we did once we started going down this biological path, um, we had did soil tests over the whole property. And this particular block that was making Grange more often than the other blocks, the, the soil was um, almost perfectly in balance. Mm. Your calcium, magnesium ratios, your, your right amount of potassium and everything else. It was almost near enough to, to perfect. And so then we worked to emulate the same system on the rest of our farm to try and adjust um, our soils to, to get it as near as possible. And that was a real, real turning point for us once we once we went down to that that stage, and we really started to see um, see, I would say, a, a lot of change on the property when, when we when we did all that. Got, got the soil balance, and then the use of biodynamics as well. Um, yeah, our, our soils became much more friable, and like Kim mentioned before, <coughs> um, heaps of earthworms in the soil, and and also. Winter time, you, you go out pruning on, on a first thing in the morning, and the sun was fairly low, just coming up, and and you see all these spider webs across your vine rows, and and you know when you see that, you know there's life in your soil. There's there's, there's everything wants to, uh, there's just life there, and it, it's it's such a good feeling to be working in an environment like that. I'll yeah. just um, you wanna? yeah add to that. I'll I'll just mention the uh, the the correlation with quality and 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 soil balance. Yeah. So uh, obviously the, the the wine makers and the grower the ASONS officers uh, that particular block they they were picking up that you know there was something uh, there was a quality there that was more more right um, and and that related to to more consistently getting grain so. Um, so it's good to see that it's not just um, a, a magical thing that uh, I, well you get it, get it right now and again and it's just by luck but there's actually some science behind it 
with uh, with the soil tests, with the results there and uh, the balancing. Were you, in that particular block, were you doing anything different to the rest of the block? Was, uh, uh, was it no, 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 we weren't. Um, it, so it just must have naturally been um, more balanced. I'm not really quite sure why. Um, we, we have a massive variation of soils across the property from almost light drift sand to, to um, you know, your black bisky, um self-mulching soils and everything in between. So, yeah, sometimes it can be a bit challenging to, um, to, to balance that. Um, but, you know, it used to be more of a challenge years ago uh, where you'd have soils where they go from suddenly really too wet um, to, to, to super dry and hard. And, and you miss that opportunity to work the soil or, or do whatever you wanted to do. And uh, you know, you've lost that. Mm. So it, it was a balancing act. But now uh, it, it's, it's so much more consistent and easier to manage. So you, do you find that you don't have to, like your, your application of biodynamic say or other, other, other inputs is pretty generally, generally the same across the whole vineyard now? Or you just still have to go to some blocks and go, you need a bit of extra love every, you know, a bit more frequently? Uh, yep, we, we still do have some blocks where we, we, we look at how the cover crop is growing and uh, we sort of say, look, you know what, that's, uh, that's not performing quite as well as some other blocks. So we'll put a little bit more compost out to help build that ground up a little bit more to produce more organic matter, uh, grow the beans a little bit better. Um, that, that'll help that soil a bit. And, um, and, that's been, and that's been working really well. Tell us about the compost, because that's that's a, that's a <coughs> what I gather a pretty important you know, practice. It's oh, it, it is. Um, it, it's been it's been a bit of a game changer, I think, because uh, uh, we've been making compost for oh, I can't even remember how long, but it's been a been a fair while, um, and it took us a while to get the blend right and the, and the brew right, um, but I think we've got it down pat now. Um, using like chicken manure, pig manure, some cow manure. Lime and gypsum, um, we use all the waste from the winery, all the stalks, all the pressings. Uh, we used to use uh, from the chaff mill. We used to have a, a screen in which um, extracted dust. So we used all the fines, um, any hay rubbish. Um, so all, all, all of the waste, the so-called waste products. Yeah. Yep, and, and <laughs> any cardboard off the property, we, we put through that, uh, that through the compost. Um, and also we put some farm clay into the compost mix as well. Far, like, oh, so you get clay from somewhere on the farm? On the property, and oh. uh, we put a little bit of that. About 10%. Uh, about 10% through. Really? Yeah. yeah. And, and is, is that for the, that's to benefit the sandier soils to try and get it to kind of... No, we, we mainly give it, use... Give it to the expert over there. <laughs> <laughs> or else he'll take it. Not that you're not an expert. <laughs> no. I'm not sure what no. he's going to say. <laughs> no, no, well, well it, it's, it's the, the colloids and the clay. Yeah. Let's push that back a little bit there, John. No, that's it. Okay, that's colloids, right. yeah. colloids and the clay that help to hold your, your nutrients in, 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 your, in your compost. That's why we... Um, that came up at one of the conferences we went to years ago, and that was... They said that's fairly important to get the clay off your land, somewhere off your own land, and uh, roughly about 10% of, of our compost mix is, is clay, and that the colloids hold the, help to make the, the minerals and, and everything you're putting in more stable and, and, and binding. So it yeah. wouldn't leach as much necessarily. That wouldn't leach, that's exactly right, it doesn't yeah, leach right. as easily, yes, that's that right. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah. You make a fair bit of compost there, so 10% of a big pile is a pretty big pile of clay. A reasonable amount of clay, yes. yes. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Hmm. Um, tell me about so, so yeah so that's and do you, you use by how do you apply biodynamics is it does the is the compost get a hit of biodynamics um, in the making process or before it goes out or how do you do you incorporate biodynamics into the compost? Yeah, so we put the uh, biodynamic compost preps in. Um, we uh, we we tend to mix them up into into water and then we actually spray it onto our uh, onto our heaps. Um, we we found that is actually the best way to um, distribute distribute them in the in the compost heap, um, and that's what we've been doing for the last uh, goodness knows how long. Because I know you you do uh, 
used to make the balls and, and, and put it into the compost. Um, but because of the sheer quantity, Sorry, we, we thought that, well, by putting in water, um, running it through the flow form, um, and then spraying it onto the heaps, um, and that seems to be working. Well, well you're getting it. the preps in there, the six preps, just a different way and much more effectively, or in terms of just the size, the quantity. Yeah, the yeah, we feel it's much more effective. Um, otherwise, we'd have to buy a, a fair old quantity of, of preps. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, ev everything in, in farming, you're looking at, at, at costings as well. So you, you keep try and keep things in check. And uh, if something is working, um, you know, we're happy to keep on going down that path. Mm. Uh, Can we also... He, you know, you were swearing about he's not going to be able to say this. Yeah. Oh, no, it's great. No, no, it's I, awesome. I, I just thought of it. Uh, we we use the compost preps, but we always we always also put in a bit of the the, the, the compost from the year before. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, good call. And and that that's like um like a, like a yeast, you might say, adding to, adding to bread. That that's already composted, and that that. Um, yeah, we, we add that as well, and that, that, that works exceptionally well. Oh, it's like well. a starter in, in That's sourdough. like a starter, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I just have a thought when you're talking about your block um, that, that, you know, that seemed to be consistently better or getting more into grange, and that was kind of the, you know, the, the, the perfect soil. Have you ever thought of or ever done, like got a sample of that, you know, done a, collected some of it, um, of that particular soil and then like put that in the compost or w watered it, put it in the flow form and with BD and kind of incorporated or inoculated the the other piles with that perfect soil or so called perfect no, soil? No, we, we haven't actually done that. We um, we take our vine cuttings from that block yeah. um, because, well, we feel that's a good clone of Shiraz. Um, so so all, our, all our cuttings come from there. Um, that they come from a younger block now that uh, we took cuttings from the older block, um, just so we get less chance of actually grabbing vines with disease, so we take it from the young block. Um, but we haven't done that with the soil, no. Mm. No, which, yeah, could be an option, actually. Um, John, <coughs> what, back in, back in the, I guess it was the uh, late 80s, early 90s, when you were kind of looking at doing things differently, what was, you, you did touch on, you know, your neighbours or others were kind of thought you were a bit weird or you didn't use that word, but then they were going, oh, this is interesting. They saw the results. What did that mean for you personally? Were you Was that a challenge for you to kind of progress, you know, pursue that? Were you worried about what the what people were going to think or say? You know, was that, was that a, socially, was that a kind of a thing that was like, oh, there's that weirdo down the road, John, who's doing <laughs> biodynamics or something? I, for the start, it, it did bother me somewhat. Um, I was a bit taken back by it sometimes, but um, over a year, couple of years, um, I just felt what we, we're doing, we felt was right. And uh, we, after that, I, I didn't really care what, what comments anyone would make to me. It didn't, it didn't really worry me at all. Because um, I just felt it was working for us and if it's something's working and we knew we'd be going down that right path, why should we worry what anyone else thinks? So, uh, yeah, it didn't it didn't worry us in the end. So. And you, Kim, yeah. did you did you experience? Because um, I guess you were leaving school when this transition was happening. So that was that's an impressionable kind of age. Yeah. No, I I, <laughs> I believed in what my parents were doing was right. I, I believed in myself. So yeah, it didn't bother me um, because we we believed in it and we were confident in what we were doing. And I think that's, that's been the difference. We've always been confident in our path that we've, we've set for ourselves. And, uh, you know, you're always looking at what everyone else is doing. Because, um, you know, if you can observe something that is being done that's being done better, um, you know, why wouldn't you do it? But um, we were, we were pr pretty happy with what we were doing. I still remember comments from a neighbour. He... Uh, he was he was undervined spraying you know multiple times under his rows and um, he, he would when you see him he'd say oh I've got such and such a weed and it's like well we've never heard of that weed and <laughs> and then then next time he'd have such and such a weed it's like oh okay you you're getting all these different weeds you 
you're getting rid of some weeds, but then these other weeds are coming in to replace these weeds, and these are way worse weeds. And and I, I still remember that. And um, and and he was he was a guy that uh, always thought that what he was doing was the best. And um, you know we didn't really take much notice of him, to be quite honest with you, because um, we were we were getting the results as far as quality goes in the wineries. Um, he was not. And um, and I mean, that's tracked through now since my brothers have started the winery. All our grapes are going to them. It, it's 100% our vineyard, our blocks represented in the, in the wine. Um, there's, there's no hiding. Um, there's no blending of someone else's grapes or whatever. And um, so, you know, it, it is what it is and uh, it stands up and uh, you know Troy will be the first one to say if if there is any issues um, but uh, you know he's, he's, he's more than happy with what we're producing and you know what he has to do in the winery um, to get it into the bottle and and how that stands up so yeah and, tr and Troy being your brother one of your brothers who's sort of the winemaker and Tony yep. Other brother who's more the marketing kind of thing. Yep, marketing and sales. And you're growing the grapes. And I'm growing with, the grapes, so. And the rye. Can't forget the rye. Yeah, that's on right. The team. Yep, yep. So, you know, we've, we're, we're pretty fortunate that everybody chose the path that they did or was interested in that path. Um, you know, my two brothers, they were never interested in being a grape grower or a farmer. That wasn't their thing. Um, Troy was always interested in. Uh, making home brews and 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 um you know wine so he was he was always set for that path uh, my brother he started off as a mechanic um did various things um and uh, and eventually um you know they, they formed koleski wines and uh and uh, and now they're you know at, at the start they they still had their day job so troy was still a winemaker at, a, at another winery Tony had a had a full time job, so they were doing the winery on the side, and then it eventually grew big enough that uh, Troy could um, leave his job, and then eventually uh, Tony leave his job and yeah, form the winery full time, and and then of course created the cellar door, and uh, the rest is sort of history. Do you think? Um, do you have any? Do you have any paradigms? that you think you need to change or you'd like to change or you kind of, you know, is there any, well, they could be practices, it could be behaviours, I don't know, is there, is there kind of, you, you know, have you reflected and at, at times and gone, oh, did I, you know, that's, that's been a challenge for me to, 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 to consider? Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, look, I think, uh, <coughs> where we are at the moment um i i think we're we're pretty comfortable and we're pretty happy with uh, the the systems we've have in place um we've we've got we've developed the right machinery to be able to manage weeds in the vineyard um that's been the biggest challenge mm. to manage weeds efficiently under, under vines under under the vines um uh but we've we've got that down pat now um you know, we've got, I think, the right amount of cropping that we do, the right amount of sheep. We, I, I think we've got the balance pretty right. We're, we're, pretty, we're pretty right with um, the amount of work that, uh, that we've got on our plate, um, the amount that we can do with machinery, the amount we can do by hand. Uh, we, get, we get some couple of contract pruners in to help us with the vineyard work, pruning time. Um, and uh, we have... Uh, we employ someone part time to help us on the farm, um, um, but yeah, I think we got the balance right. Mm. Mm. Um, how does the philosophy of the farm kind of um, uh, join up with the your, your influence? Could be vice versa. The, the your health philosophy and domestically, you know, with family and kind of you live you live on farm, so it's kind of yeah. Tell us about that. Well, um, we feel that anything that we produce on the farm <coughs> is, is grown to the best of our ability and, and, and hopefully 
as, as healthily as possible. Um, so the, the organic oats that we grow for four leaf milling, um, we believe it's full of minerals and um, vitamins and, and uh, that, that's going to people's uh, breakfast cereals. And so hopefully that's, uh, that's very beneficial to someone's health. And, and obviously the grapes that we produce, they're all biodynamic. Um, and there is no nasties, there's no bad stuff in there uh, for people. So we've got a clear conscience that people that are eating and drinking these products um, are, are getting some of the, the, the well, cleanest products that they can mm. effectively. And my mum grows a lot of vegetables. We, we're growing quite a few vegetables too, making preserves and pickles and, and, and things like that. And my wife is, is baking sourdough. So we are trying to um, produce food ourselves that we know has got no chemicals in, that's nice and healthy for our children, that you know we're, we're doing the best that we can. And you know there's always more to be done. Um, and uh, uh, my wife Amy, she, I think she sees what we're doing, um, I guess, I mean, she's been in the family for a long time, but from an outsider's point of view, because I guess dad's always been on the farm all his life. I've been on the farm all my life. Sometimes we don't see what we've got. Um, uh, I mean, it's very special, but we don't always see it as that special because it's, it's always what we've done. And, uh, and Amy makes us more aware of what we've got. And uh, she is trying to develop the uh, Koleski Farm brand more and with social media and stuff like that. So, um, which is good to have that because sometimes um, you just need a few other people to say, you know, what you've got is pretty special here. And, um, oh, and we're producing, um, you know, fat lambs as well. So biodynamic fat lambs and we have our own meat. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. So I've been here, Hamish and I have been here for the last couple of days. We've uh, eaten like kings, like with, as part of the, 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 um, the workshop, but outside of that. Um, dinners and so on and it's just wonderful i mean just the sense of you know how you are on a farm and it is possible you've got wine which is pretty special in the first place um you've, you know you've got protein you've got lambs and so on um you have you know fruit and vegetables and to sit down you know with <coughs> your mum and dad and with you know amy and all the crew here at the workshop and to be pretty much eating everything that's come from the farm, mm. and it be absolutely delicious. And knowing, you know, it's important for us that as we run these workshops, that the food that we 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 provide to the attendees is reflective of what we're talking about. Mm. And this absolutely is like it's it's, it's just absolutely wonderful that um, we we we're here and we, we you know this is the sort of food we can offer the, the attendees. But just to know that you know there are people like you guys, your family, and your intergenerational you know the legacy there that is um, setting a really high standard for you know the combination of farm philosophy and farming and growing produce and what you do you know Steiner talks about external cultivation which is obviously outside in the paddock and then internal cultivation which is what happens mm. in the kitchen you know mm. it goes for the door and who's responsible for that it's no point if, you know you creating a wonderful product if it gets burnt or you know whatever you know it's, it's not prepared with the same sort of reverence and that happens here 100 percent. absolutely and and also what uh talking about yesterday in the workshop um your intent and you know i think our our intent has always been to produce something of high quality and uh you know um chemical free uh that's actually helping people's health and not hindering it with unfortunately most of the products that are out there. Um, the way what's called, I guess, modern farming or conventional farming is going. Uh, low, low minerals, low vitamins, um, low food value, which um, yeah, is, is no good for people's health. Your contribution to the community and you know, whoever's buying your wine, because that's, I guess that's the product that gets furthest as further as the field is amazing. Yep. Um, and I thank you for being so inspiring. John, um, I'm just conscious of time and we need to, I've got one little segment after this that's for our Patreon members, so it's like a, they 
they have to pay for it basically is what it is <laughs> <laughs> they pay 10 bucks a month it's like two, it's like two coffees um, and they get um, uh, webinars once a month, they get these Q&As, this um, extra content uh, Q&As and weekly videos from me. Actually, I have to do one, can you mind me? I've got to do one um, when we, oh no, in the, in the smart code break. I just sit there, I stand there for 10 minutes and yabber on about whatever's going on, so I'll bang on about Klesky Farm. Um, John, you, I, I understand <coughs> you were awarded the Vigneron of the Year recently, 2015, 16? Was it by yeah, the barons of, of of Barossa? Yeah, that's right. That that's is right. Quite yeah. a, that's yeah. quite a that's quite a quite a quite a thing. Yeah, it was an honour to to uh, receive that. Yeah, it certainly was. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I can really <laughs> say to <for> that. <laughs> you must be doing something right then, because that because we last year we Angelica and I we, I did a did a, a talk at the um, uh, wonderful to be there at the Barossa wine uh, grape growers and wine producers. Um, uh, at their wonderful building there, yeah. um, which in itself is amazing, and the and the the barons of Barossa, that that well, not, well, that that area, that room, that yeah. long yeah. mirrored, it's yeah. amazing in there, and the number of um, of Barossanese, is that a word? Barossa, are you two Barossanese of the Barossanese people? Like you, exactly. <laughs> 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 oh, no, sure that's are. right. Yeah, a Barossa is of a Barossanese. <laughs> <laughs> the um, just the the history there of of wine. I mean, it just shows you what what a remarkable area this is, and the and the and the products that have been grown here wine wise for for many many years. So mm. to be bestowed that um, that award, John, I know you're a very humble man, but you need. I'm going to pump your tyres up. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I it was uh, you know I certainly appreciated getting the reward, but it's um, yeah. Apart from that, I yeah. <laughs> well, you, you must have been pretty uh, proud then, <coughs> Kim. Were you? Oh, definitely. It was a very proud moment for me to to see Dad recognised for all his hard work over the years. Um, so yeah, I I was more than happy for him to get it. it was fantastic. Cause, I mean, he's uh, you know he, he's he's been working hard and with with Mum with the vineyard yeah, with mum, mum. and um, you know Mum's been by his side the whole time and if, if dad didn't have mum working beside him doing all the work that she did we wouldn't be where we are today no definitely not um not at all because i mean they, they started off well they built the dairy started off the chaff mill mum was working with dad in the chaff mill do, doing that hard work uh, for a long long time and um you know if dad didn't have that support of mum I'm not sure where the property would be no, today. We wouldn't be to the level that we are. No, yeah. no. Without a doubt. Um, and as they say, behind every great man is a great woman, and that's just certainly that's certainly right. the case. That's and, right, definitely. Uh, 100. Right. Um, and I've not, I've you know that's been very evident, and she's she's very humble as well, and she just gets on and does it, and I just you know you hear hear that, like as we've touched on stories of you know her her contribution, massive contribution, and her support for what you guys are doing, and what a, what a woman she is. So big hats off to Lorraine and Amy as well, you know, because she she's you know she I guess um, being a, the, the next generation and um, you know on social media and and kind of um, you know, has her very big role to play um, in the business, and it's awesome that we're here. It's really because of her that we're here and yeah. organising that and, and being enthused about it all. Absolutely, and I mean last year she started a uh, a sourdough um, bread business. Um, and uh, which went really well, uh, a little bit too well. Um, she almost burned herself out um, by it. So, um, but uh, look, um, she's going to get back into that uh, this year pretty soon and uh, get all the packaging right and, and everything like that, labelling. Um, and you're using some of your wheat? And uh, yeah, we grew some wheat last year. Um, so she's been playing around with that, milling some of that, and. Uh, and producing some loaves of bread, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. That's um, just another another thing that we're growing on the farm that uh, Amy's turning into uh, into a good product and uh, represents, you know, what we're doing here. Well, I love what you're doing here. We better wrap it up. I've got a quick a quick Q and A to do before we get to the workshop. It starts shortly. Um, thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. This is exciting. Yeah. It's the first time I've done a father son kind of a. A chat. Oh, yeah? I've done mm. husband and wife 
before. But this has worked really well and it's just fascinating. And as I said, lovely to hear you guys chatting away here and the eavesdropping a little bit. Not too <laughs> much, not on purpose. But, just, but then, you know, we're looking out here and the, the, the vines and it's just a wonderful um, legacy that you guys are creating that, um, you know, we talk about. It was interesting that, you know, Kim's the seventh generation and we, you know, my interest in traditional owners and, and, and indigenous cultures around the world and they always, they seem to be looking seven, seven generations in front. So, um, you know, Kim, you might be thinking about the 14th generation uh, <laughs> <laughs> going forward. Oh, God. <laughs> John the 13th. Um, yeah. No pressure. But um, I think that you, your family done a remarkable job to, to you know, have the eighth generation on the ground, on this ground. Uh, yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, thank we'll you, wrap Charlie. It up and we'll, um, yeah. we'll do a quick, quick other one in a minute. Okay. Okay.